afternoon or let's say good evening. Uh, my name is Ahmad Sadegi from Technical University Darmstadt. And I'm going to chair this panel on impact of academic security research. I called it frogs in uh, wells, storms in teacups, and raw diamonds. As you rem uh, may remember, uh, the chairs of the conference, uh, Christopher Krugel was the first one who mentioned about the pro procedure of collecting uh, papers from 830 submissions. And this conference is uh, getting bigger and bigger and more uh, with more impact. So is it not great to be in this place rather than in Denver in some hotel? So let's say. So, <clears throat> so it shows that uh, having CCS in Europe with more than 1,000 uh, participants breaking any, any record is very important. Now we would like to talk about the impact of our big community. And uh, I have here distinguished guests that uh, you will see them on the, on the uh, uh, display. So we have uh, the academic, two academic pioneers uh, uh, from Europe, Professor Ross Anderson and Professor uh, Bart Prenel. I personally admire them for for their character and their uh, uh, diversity in, in their research, and they have influenced the research in Europe, but also internationally for many years. They will say something about themselves. Then we have the young and ambitious, uh, an excellent example of uh, uh, young researchers in Europe. I just chose you because of that. That's Davide Maserati. <laughs> then, then we have Anand Rajan, we have industry representatives. Anand Rajan, uh, who is a uh, uh, leader of a lab for emerging technologies, or f and he will say something about it. Then we have uh, Robert Brobeck from uh, Cisco. And we have uh, Greg Shannon from, uh, let's say, fr and his connections to uh, White House regarding the uh, cybersecurity research. They will introduce themselves very shortly. But let me tell you why I invited uh, this constellation. You may ask yourself, why are no Google representatives here? Because they are everywhere, although I like many of them. So I thought it would be better that to have industries that are with hardware and software and co-design uh, that or may not be representative in most conferences. And uh, this is why we invited uh, Anand and, and Robert. So, you can start, Greg, with introducing yourself. Please keep it short. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm uh, the Assistant Director for Cybersecurity Strategy uh, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, National Security and Information, uh, no, National Security and International Affairs, long title. Uh, but I'm glad to talk about uh, the administration's uh, perspectives on R&D and the role of the research community in uh, uh, economic prosperity and national security. I'm sure many of you are interested in writing uh, proposals, so be a good friend to uh, Greg. Uh, I'm Robert Broberg. I'm a distinguished engineer at Cisco Systems. I'm part of the Advanced Security Research and Government Group, and I'm part of the, say, maybe the first research lab we've started at Cisco uh, into advanced security initiatives. Hello, I'm Anand Rajan. Uh, I direct uh, the Emerging Security uh, Research Lab in Intel Labs, uh, and uh, I lead a team of uh, researchers that focuses on security for the cloud all the way down to IoT and wearables. Davide Valzarotti, I'm an associate professor at the Euricom Institute in South of France, and uh, I think today I'm here because, uh, not much about because of my achievements, but because uh, I plot some statistics about your work at the top conferences, and Ahmad believes that this is important for... No, you are very modest. You are here because you are young and ambitious. Young and ambitious, okay. and I plot your statistics. <laughs> um, my name is Bart Prenel. I'm a professor at the University of Leuven in the COSIG iMac lab. I have a background, actually, in hardware design and control theory. I switched to crypto, but I also did some work on uh, hardware, security, privacy, and system security. Um, I'm Ross Anderson, Professor of Security Engineering at Cambridge. Um, you probably heard enough from me already this morning, uh, but we do lots of other things too in our group. Okay, so let me, uh, I go to the slide. Please uh, change it to the slide. 
So first, I would like to make a note. And uh, since we are at CCS, I don't know who has heard about NSA security literature review. Anybody? Haven't you received any email from NC State? Nobody. So maybe I am the only one who gets these emails. <laughs> so NSA has, oh, you got, oh, sorry, 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 I didn't see you. Uh, so I mean, I don't want to go through it. I just, uh, I don't know if it's a spam or is the new uh, program of NSA to try to, the goal of this uh, literature review is that you, see, you, that you get an email and they tell you, hey, we want information from you because we want to know if you we can replicate your research. Because many of the implementation and evaluations that we, uh, many of us maybe promise in our papers may not work at all. So maybe this is the reason why NSA is trying to do an exhaustive uh, replication. Or maybe uh, there are, uh, I don't know, uh, competitions between conferences. Uh, maybe Usenix people is behind it. Or maybe other, when they send it to uh, CCS uh, papers. Anyway, so when I, whenever I ask uh, uh, people from NC State about this, because uh, the email has a signature, I just anonymized the name, as a postdoc at the NC State, they always say, oh, sorry, I have a call, or uh, I have to go out, or they look out of the window and uh, start counting the trees. So what, what I would like to say to this community is that please, NC State, stop this uh, spamming because it is getting really annoying. We get a lot of papers, a lot of emails about different papers that we sell. I wanted to use this uh, panel to mention that because, because <laughs> replicating the research that we are doing is not easy, and I don't understand the reason behind it. So uh, the main subject of this panel is, as I mentioned, the real world impact, or maybe the lack of it, of academic security and uh, privacy research in the light of today's challenges. And I, uh, in my abstract, I put two uh, questions, and I would like uh, everyone on the panel to talk about it. And then you have the uh, opportunity to also ask questions. So the first question is that there is a huge pressure, especially in US, on tenure track and grant uh, raising, what I call it grant raising syndrome, that it has, has led to a tendency to kind of be running behind the trend, trends instead of making substantial research. I am not excluded. Um, so what is the significance of, of our research? Is it a kind of storm in a teacup? Or, or we, we really lost the, the big picture because of many small delta results? I mean, we can debate about it, and I would like to debate that. Another thing is that. I mean, if you have 830 submissions, uh, how you pick the substantial research out. And another thing is that how valuable are our contributions uh, for society, for impact in real world? Uh, do we have impact? I mean, the youngsters, they want to have the pile of papers. But how about the senior ones? Do we really want to have the impact in society? If yes, is what we are doing the right way? And I give first the first word to Ross Anderson. Ross Anderson, do you think that our Research is marginal. We are generating too many deltas instead of uh, solving real problems. I just connect to your keynote. Um, well, the advice that I got as a young research student from my own thesis advisor, the late Roger Needham, uh, was this. He said, good research is done with a shovel, not with tweezers. And if you find yourself down on your hands and knees scrabbling around for the crumbs that a thousand mathematicians have left, then it's best to leave that to the University of East Mudflats, he said. Go and find a big pile of muck and drive your shovel into it, because that's where you'll find something interesting and important. Bart. Well, I think we, of course, need both types of research. And I mean, I think saying it's delta maybe is too negative. But I think the, the whole publication system and the tenure track system of course, drives us a bit to publishing many smaller results. And I think we should, as a community, better reward people who make more, more rounded papers, longer papers. Um, but of course, we have to then change our publication model and at the same time also change our tenure model. So what would be the best publication model? We have now some uh, trials. And I know that you were advocating this for many years, myself as well. Uh, maybe you just elaborate on that. Of course, I don't know what the best publication model is. 
it just turns out that the computer science community that grew up in the 80s converged on this conference model um, because the main argument was maybe social interaction but also fast publication. But today you have fast publication on archive or ePrint, so you don't need conferences for this. And I think the conferences are a bit exploding. So we get actually 800 submissions and then all 650 are rejected and they will be resubmitted somewhere else. And so we get kind of a reviewing crisis that we have way too many reviews. Our papers are revised after reviewing or not. And I think also the review process is too much looking for flaws rather than looking for diamonds and help them to polish them. And so the model which comes from VLDB, open VLDB, um, and has been copied by Popets and now also by the fast software encryption community, so transactional symmetric cryptology, is to have the Dromal conference hybrid. And I had some experience um, both in Popets and in the FSC community. As a reviewer, you're more encouraged to find the positive thing in the paper and say if you change the following things, then actually we'll accept it next time. And so I think it's, I find it a much more positive experience and you avoid the re and re-reviewing of the same things um, or slightly updated papers. The model also has disadvantages, of course, because if your paper ends up with the same person, you may have kind of a small set of people blocking you from publishing. And I think in general, the acceptance rates we have today are a threat to the community in that we should actually have a base threshold, but if you get, create extremely competitive conferences, you just start discriminating against subfields. I think that's the risk of having high competition. Of course, all the quality which accepted is very good, but you have a competition between subfields for the few slots. David, I have a special question for you. You have made this study on uh, uh, impact of uh, researchers and their productivity. And maybe one day this uh, statistic that you are doing will be a kind of source of citation for all kind of grand proposals saying, I have this impact because Davide said that. And Davide has, has you know, put a lot of uh, uh, time in that to make this. Uh, so what are your criteria? What, what was the motivation behind that? Right, so first of all, you put a title there that you know, I did something measuring the impact that was not the goal of my page. So let me start by saying that, you know, there was not really a why, it was more like a why not. I mean, originally I plot, I mean, I don't know if you're all familiar, I just put online some blog posts in which I measure uh, all sorts of different things basically based on the submission, but the paper accepted in the top four conferences, so uh, Usenix, uh, CCS, uh, Oakland, and NDSS. In the why you took these uh, conferences? Uh, well, I took those conferences initially because I was collecting them already for other reasons and uh, because we kind of all agree that these are the most important venues in system security, not necessarily security. So if you work on crypto, definitely there are other venues as well. So um, I start with these four because, again, my goal was not to measure impact, so I didn't want to be comprehensive. I just want to have some representative data set, right? So I just wanted to see some things like, uh, is it really true that the U.S. are completely driving the field or not? And for that, you don't need to measure everything. You just need to have something that you believe is representative. And I believe that, you know, in our field, those four com top conferences, if you work in system security, you probably want to target them. And so we can use them at least to get some indication. So, so what do you think about, uh, you said it, it was not about the impact of just productivity and also comparison between Europe and uh, US. But what happens if, if people start to really cite you? I mean, I even used yeah. unfortunately, one of Unfortunately, yeah, yeah that happened. I, I mean, I didn't expect that. It kind of blew up a bit of those. Once you put it there, it's like tweeting. People, uh, you have followers, lovers, groupies, yes. uh, they will uh, yeah. run behind you. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. clear. It is true. So it has been used for a lot of different things. Uh, I guess different people, you know, look for different, obviously, messages in there. Exactly. You know, this is just data and just plot, so I don't say anything. You just, you know, this is the data. And I think it's more important to talk about what is behind this number that most of the people are actually focused on the numbers, like, you know, hey, this number is like that. And I think it's more important to understand why those numbers are like that. Like, you know, if it's true that the U.S. are driving the field, why they're driving the field. Is it because they have a bad funding scheme, etc.? So I think, you know, the numbers are there and then everyone can look at, you know, the numbers in different ways. Um, well, so I had a, a discussion with one of our colleagues, I don't uh, say the name. He's a very excellent, I mean, really excellent assistant professor, but because of your report, he was extremely depressed. So 
uh, after a lot of alcohol, he got to, to himself and started talking, uh, saying that there are groups in, in this community, they have 20 students or 15 students, and they can, of course, produce much more than a small assistant professor somewhere, no, let's say, in the middle of nowhere in the US. Uh, what do you think about this? This statistic has made this guy completely depressive. So do you feel responsibility here? <laughs> yes. So, I think kind of I pressure. Go and no drink no pressure. And no. Try to cheer it up. shows that we didn't talk about how, what he answers before right, the so panel. It's a difficult question. So it is true that there are some groups that are very big and they publish a lot of papers. And it is true that some people are not very happy about that setup. You know, there are conferences that try to limit this, uh, you know, in our field, but not only in our field. ICSI this year only limits to three papers per author, you know, the number of submissions. So first of all, I don't think it's bad the fact that we have big groups. And I think it's a natural phenomenon. I mean, if you get the right people and you put them in an environment in which they can try, they will grow. And not everyone wants to have a big group. I'm sure there are very excellent professors in small universities that they just don't want to have a big group because they like a one-to-one -one relationship, and it's perfectly okay. But there are people that like to have maybe a bigger group, and if they're successful, they get more papers, they get more visibility, more students, more grant, uh, and, you know, the machine grows. But maybe they also get more heart attacks, so is that the way that we want? Uh, that I'm not responsible for that. Okay. Uh, but I, I, getting to your point, I think, was very important, though. I think uh, I'm definitely against this uh, you know, movement to try to limit the publication from big groups, because I think that doesn't make any sense. I mean, as a conference organizer, I just want to get the best paper published, and if I have 20 papers from a single author that are all very good, I want to publish them all, in my opinion. But can, but can that, that happen, that 20 papers from the same group, they are very good? Why not? I mean, if you have a, I don't know, I mean, I, I am assuming yes. Actually, behind big groups, typically you have good people, right? That's because, you know, originally they were small groups and then they had to, you know, build it. So I think there are good people there and it's perfectly okay to have many papers. However, I think what is more dangerous, and you mentioned it, I think, is the fact that from the funding side, so uh, it's already true, I guess, that industry tends to give money more to, you know, visible yes, universities. Those guys, well they, they give money to Berkeley rather PR, than yeah, to... It's a good, uh, you know, yeah. PR, etc. Yeah. And now also funding agency, they... I know that some of them already use my pages, which I found it quite uh, well, strange. Uh, so it's possible now also funding agencies say, well, if I need to give money, Let's give it to this big group because I know that they publish very well, etc. And there is nothing wrong with that, obviously, because they do publish well and they do good work. But we need to be careful not to end up in a position in which the richest get richer and richer and the, the small group just die because they cannot find fundings. So that would be very bad, honestly. So, of Don't, course, this is the, uh, my fault, the yes. ba basis of the capitalism. And if the research becomes a business, then capitalism plays an important role in it. But so at I, the same I, time, it's hard to prevent, I guess, because if you need to give money, this is a quick way to find out, hey, and it does make sense, right? Okay. I know this guy is good. Let's give him... I agree. I don't want to put pressure more on you. Before we go to our industrial representatives and Greg, any questions? Do you want to direct? I mean, this is a very good opportunity to ask questions. And even if you are an assistant professor, you can ask. Nobody is going to write a reference tonight for you because afterwards we go for dinner and uh, lots of drinking. So forget about it. It's not a PC meeting. Just stay up and say something. Say something if the system is, is flawed or the system should be changed. You should say that. We as a community can change everything. So any question? We paid for these micro microphones. I mean, the organizer said they, they cost money, so <laughs> use them. You want to ask a question? OK. Well, there's, um, there's a reply I could make to what's just been said, uh, oh, which is question. Well, we've got a question. Well, oh. let me just say briefly um, that I think that many of the things that are complained of could be mitigated if money followed the talent rather than the institution. Now, there's a number of organizations like the ERC and like Royal Society Research Professorships, which are basically ad hominem merit awards. Uh, were I the fund giver, what I would do uh, would be to hand out um, a five-year postdoctoral fellowship to the people who write the top 1,000 PhD thesis in Britain every year in whichever subject 
and let them go and do their postdoc wherever they want. And you would find that many of these people wouldn't go to big teams uh, led by grey-bearded old farts. They would go to um, teams who were led by young faculty members who were doing something really cool and exciting. Because it's the people who have just finished their PhDs who know better than anybody else what's hot and what's not. Give them the money and let the rest of it follow. So please be just uh, shy. Let's go. That was not for Shai, that was for Ross Anderson, I assume, yeah? Okay, so please go. Does it work? Yeah. I just wanted to go back to your original question. Um, I was hoping before we dive into process that there would be some words of answer whether our research has an impact. You know, what kind of research did you see in these top conferences in the last three years that you thought, wow, this is research that really needed to happen? Uh, whereas what kind of things you'd think, why isn't this conference have more of that research that I think needs to, to have happened? I mean, things that are more about the research than about the process behind it. Very good question. So who wants to answer this question? Before our young, very young, extremely young participant ask a question. I know him. I'll just make one comment on that. So I was actually impressed by the test of time award. And maybe we have to kind of set up some kind of uh, process centered around that, because that's one way of evaluating whether the research actually had impact. Though it took 10 years to go figure that out. But uh, No, yeah. uh, I have a different uh, view to that, because I think test of time is something that uh, it depends what kind of criteria you are using, citations, it's kind of, it doesn't say really something about uh, real practical impact or real world impact or societal impact. I, I personally, okay. I just intervene okay. in need that. So maybe, Greg, you want to say something about, let's just say cybersecurity and funding <laughs> and the directions? Um, so, uh, you know, Linus Pauling has this uh, nice quote uh, that if you want to have, I'm, 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 I'm probably not quite accurate, but you know, if you want to have good ideas, have a lot of ideas, which means that some of those ideas are not going to be good. And I think that's, you know, from a strategic point of view, you know, the national investment that uh, countries make, you know, recognize that fact. Uh, I think the other thing is, I mean, you look at uh, the keynote yesterday, uh, Martin Heller receives the Turing Award after how many decades and the sort of impact that he had. So, you know, there is the test of time challenge and the, you know, the National Academy of St uh, Sciences in the United States has done a number of studies to show that it can take decades for research to have the impact on society and everybody to say, oh yes, that was fabulous research. Uh, not only a particular paper, but the whole process and the whole community that had been forming. I think, you know, Ross's work in terms of addressing poverty in Africa is pretty amazing, but that is based on decades of work uh, many ideas coming together, and uh, you know, it, it takes that community effort. And so I think that's one way to, to consider it. Um, and, and I realize everybody has to get tenure and everybody has to pay bills, uh, but you know, from a national strategy, it's really about this national, these national capacities that we're building uh, across the Western country, or you know, around the world. Thank you. Luke, go on. Thank you, Professor Zadigi. Uh, as you pointed out, I'm fairly young. Maybe I haven't become calloused yet. Uh, so in my own research, I don't have the question of whether or not uh, we have impact. I think we have huge impact. My question is sometimes, um, are we doing the right thing? Is it good impact, or, or are we uh, hurting people? Uh, so the question came up during our interviews with Apple, is me publishing this paper more important than customer security? Uh, because there was a very strong danger that certain vulnerabilities would not be solved in time for the conference to release the paper. At the same time, there's a tremendous pressure to publish. You can't just skip a conference and graduate a year later. That's not an option for us. So uh, is our current publishing model, uh, does it, should it be changed now that we have things like the DRAMer attack that are very, very hard to recover from, exploding smartphones, uh, vehicles that are difficult to replace, um, are, are we really doing the most good by publishing these vulnerabilities in conferences? Okay, Rob. So I would say one thing about impact and, and the way uh, information is disseminated that you should consider, right? It's hard, to, I mean, you don't want to 
contain information, or it's, put it this way, it's very hard to contain information that changes things a lot. But when you're trying to change corporations and big institutions, there's an inertia built into them, right? That it's just very hard to move, right? I mean, you're trying to change I mean, some of these bugs that are brought up and vulnerabilities that are brought up, right? We have stuff deployed all over the world that's not touched, that people don't understand exists anymore, right? The people that put it there, they're gone, right? So in many cases, you just cannot fix it, right? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't publish it, right? Because some people are gonna figure it out. You may not be the first. You may, it may be figured out by somebody else and they're using it for bad reasons. So I, I really think, my view anyway is, you find problems, let the community know. I mean, there's certainly a tier, a tiered effect by which you can do that, right? CVEs, private conversations, but you know, at some point, you know, that's going to stop, and you may not be able to change anything, right? So there is a gentleman there. Question, please. I want to go back to the original prompt for a moment, and uh, in can you speak up, please? Well, in your opening, you talked about deltas as small changes, research that you didn't see having a lot of impact, but sometimes a given body of research doesn't need to be transformed. Sometimes there needs to be slow plotting progress. Um, what do you think is the correct balance between small plotting progress and looking for transformative sudden changes to the field? I think Greg mentioned that uh I can't. But also we can change yeah. to Bart. So just a quick comment on that, though. Uh, so while it's hard to give you a percentage, you know, is it 50-50 uh, between exploratory research versus uh, something that might, uh, you know, be closer to practical value, but the mix is important. I completely agree, because you don't want to be so f practically or, you know, transfer efficiency focused that you miss the diamonds in the rough. Whereas if you get, you know, too, you know, uh, spread out, you know, in your research, then it's very hard to improve the hit rate or transfer efficiency. So you do need that balance. So Bart and then Greg. I think, well, the attack work is very important. And I think there we should really try to balance the interest of society with our urge to publish. And I wonder whether it's really so important to publish in the next three months. And of course, in the today's system it is, but maybe we should change our system so that this can be delayed a little bit. But I'm all in favor for open information and for not withholding information, but it's a matter of time scales, I guess. Correct. The long term versus short term, I think it's a very difficult discussion, and I think it's very difficult to name topics. But And so Shai criticizes us for looking at the method of publishing or looking only at, um, not at, at the content, but rather at why we do it, but I think the way you actually publish influences the way research is being done. <coughs> and I think if in a journal model, typically people take more time, don't rush their papers and finish a topic and then make long-term progress. And I think for our communities to find a balance, but I think if you want to have long-term impact, you probably need to do less delta work and make more rounded long-term contributions for designing secure solutions. Can it, Greg, do you want to say and then we so, go to So that. given the level of investments that are made uh, by our respective countries, uh, you know, in the United States, it's on the order of $700 million a year uh, that goes into unclassified cybersecurity research. You know, part of a, an important impact, uh, independent of the publishing, is just the training of, you know, students, whether they're masters, postdocs, you know, not everyone's going to go off and be a professor in the university, and not everyone's going to continue to publish. And I think that's an important thing to realize that how that contributes to the national capacity to deal with cybersecurity. They go off and work in industry, they go off and work in public sector jobs. Uh, and that's an important part of how, you know, the idea, so even if it's a plotting result that someone got and was able to publish, they have a comprehension of what the state of the art is, what the possibility is, what the mechanisms and the theories are that contribute to this body of work. And I think that transfer of knowledge is a big part of the impact. So. Yes, we want to advance knowledge. We want to uh, uh, fight back our ignorance uh, in cybersecurity. Uh, the other comment I'll make is, you know, we're a young discipline, you know, and we're talking about things that I think uh, other disciplines, the physicists, the biologists, uh, uh, the psychologists have dealt with. I mean, they have much larger conferences. You know, the notion of a thousand people at a conference is, you know, a small conference in some disciplines. 
And so I think we need to think about, you know, these are, these are natural growing pains. Okay. So before we go to the next gentleman there and then to Matthias, uh, I should um, just tell one, one organizational thing. Uh, the buses to the restaurant, they go at, uh, I think, 15 past 7. So don't be worried about buses. You will get to the bus. And they are flexible. The organizers has, has, uh, have done everything to uh, please us. So don't worry about that. We want to discuss, have a good discussion. So go on, please. So I have uh, two very different kinds of background here. Um, I'm actually a math PhD student. And there, there's a very different publishing culture, very different funding culture. And it's also one that's extremely specialized in certain ways and rewards lots of deep research. The other experience I have is in very practical applied I wouldn't even call it cybersecurity research. I would say it was penetration, um, finding CVEs in products. And one, ye one summer, I broke four reasonably used SSL implementations with bugs that were 15, 20 years old. And then recently, we've seen uh, Cisco, for instance. There was an exploit in, shadow, in the Shadow Broker leak, which, used, which targeted SNP. Uh, which is a network protocol used to, in, used to transfer data about what's going on in routers. And it was a, it was a parsing bug in the ASN1 design. And these bugs were actually very widely exploited in the 90s. And we've known for many years how to build systems that, are, that don't have these kinds of flaws. And Cisco, you know, I'm naming them because of one of the panelists. Uh, any company which deploys software widely is going to have bugs which we know how to cure entire classes of. And so my, I think my fundamental question is, is the notion of applied cybersecurity research and these deltas, we, oh, we make these deltas because they're practical improvements, is that really what's going on? Or is it that industry ignores the improvements that we have on the table and the, re the funding community is just pretending to have an impact and really will be better off if we funded long-term research that would eventually be useful. I'll, I'll take that. Okay, um, just before you, I, I think there were many questions. I think when you answer one of or two of them, if no, you can uh, remember uh, it. And one. another thing is that Cisco products are good because they are sponsoring this conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget that. Yeah. Very important point to think. Well, okay, please. We, we, we will sponsor conferences regardless of the outcome, as long as there is a positive outcome. But, but anyway, to your point about bugs not being fixed, it goes back to the point I made earlier about institutional inertia. There are a lot of components to that, okay? One, just because a CVE gets submitted, right, it doesn't necessarily get to a person that can actually do anything with it, right? And in a large company like Cisco or Nokia or, I mean, you can name any large infrastructure provider, right, it, it may get lost in the shuffle, right? It's certainly no large company's intent to ignore critical infrastructure bugs, uh, number one. And number two, okay, a lot of these products you mentioned from the 90s, a lot of products are deployed, okay? They stay deployed, they're never touched again. Companies that deploy them, there are enterprise companies that deploy firewalls that are, they were deployed 10, 15 years ago when firewalls were just coming out. They haven't been touched. Why aren't they touched? Because they work just fine until an exploit's actually used, okay? And, and then it's a panic, right? These types of security bugs we see, a lot of them that are presented here, exploits, there's very little incentive to fix them until they become a crisis. The whole mindset, okay, around security that really needs to change is we need to build secure systems. If you look at other infrastructure systems, right, building, power, uh, steam generation, things like that, they have building codes that have been there for, you know, in some cases over a century, right, and they've take to, taken a long time to develop. This, I mean, the internet, right, effectively for us, right, is 20 years old, right? So it's, these are growing pains. Unfortunately, it's critical infrastructure, and, and we're going to take time to develop process to fix things. We're going to take a lot more time to figure out how to build things that aren't broken. Okay, so we go to the next one, Matthias. Thanks. So I would like to ask the panel about their opinion on the perceived disparity between attack research and defense research. 
On one hand, we have attacks that can often be generated or contrived in a week or two, then published without that much scientific meaning or that much generalization that is possible. On the other hand, we have defenses that often take years to develop and they are rejected again and again because of some small, tiny issue that the reviewer finds. And it can be very cumbersome for academics to actually publish it. And then on one hand, the, dis the disparity between attack and defense, and on the defensive side, how much should academics actually develop defenses? Should we develop a final product or just the, the rough idea? So maybe I just make, I think this is a very good point. I had a slide on that, but you already mentioned that, so I just skip that slide. This is indeed a, a painful aspect for many researchers. When you write an attack paper, p uh, you see in the PC meetings or in the reviews, they say, oh, it's a fun paper. But what has fun to do with substantial research, guys? No, I'm just joking. It's, it's indeed, indeed, attack papers are more popular. We see the trend. Uh, and building systems takes a lot of time. A PhD student sits there maybe for one year, and the reviewer says, hey, but what is about Windows? You didn't implement it for Windows. So is that the right way? Who wants to ask? So I want to address that as well as the earlier question. Um, you know, I think attack paper is an important part of uh, our community. Uh, Sergey Bratis uh, had a nice article uh, last year, I believe, where he talked about, you know, the role of, uh, you know, breaking things and how that informs uh, better security models. But I think it also ties back to, you know, it's really what's the, the, the commonality here. And it goes back to the earlier comment where the, speak, the questioner asserted, we know how to build secure systems. Um, I would strongly push back on that, and that's a challenge to this community. I mean, you can type at the rate of, uh, you know, essentially four lines of code a minute. You know, we can't obviously produce secure code at that rate. So I would say that we actually don't know how to write systems. I mean, Cisco certainly is going to use something that's effective and efficient, but we as a research community has not provided that. So when a new attack comes out, the question that this, this community can ask themselves is, how is that informing a better tool chain? And if you can't answer that question, I think that, you know, then society can look at you and say, yeah, that was a nice shiny bobble you found, but that didn't really benefit society. So I think the, the obligation is back to you as researchers to figure out how to make sure that that gets transformed back into how we create systems that are more secure and to be mindful of that all the time. Okay, sorry. So we go to the next gentleman, and then afterwards I would like to go a bit slightly, change the topic to other things, but still, remain in the same context, please. So um, one positive thing I picked up in the beginning was the idea that real problems can drive good research. So my question, I have a question for the panelists and one suggestion. So first, how can one find real problems? Or what can the community do to make these real problems better known to people who could solve them or who would want to solve them? And one idea I just spontaneously had, I'm not sure if it's any good, is that even a conference like CCS could have events where, for example, people who are known to have these real problems are invited to give talks as a special sort of sessions where people can listen to, you know, for, for some new hot technology areas or others. Okay, I mean, really... I, 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 sorry, I have sorry. one more thing, Daniel, if I may say. One thing is, but when one looks at real problems, it immediately becomes very messy and then people don't want to do it. That's yeah, that's true. And uh, of course, if you and want to know the uh, problems, you can sign NDAs with many companies, but that will not go out as a publication. So you want to answer a short answer, and then we go. I think, Andrew, you were, you were in the line. You want to ask a question afterwards? Go. I mean, I think, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, joked indeed, um, I think industry has many real problems, but they may not always be willing to share them in public. And I think what this research community may be lacking is a long-term research agenda with common challenges to work on. I know there is some attempts to do it. Um, in, in crypto, it has been a bit easier. For example, there have been these competitions organized by NIST or organized in Europe. It's a bit easier, primitive, but I think to have long-term challenges where we can all agree as a community things we should try to do would be very, I think, inspiring for long-term research problems and also would inform also secure design methods. So maybe, Andrew, you just mentioned Hi, yeah, Andrew Myers from Cornell. So I would like to believe that the, the net effect of the computer science research community would be to make computer security better. And so, so this is something that kind of troubles me when we think about the ratio between attacks and defenses. So we can imagine a sort of extreme version where all of us simply work on attack papers. 
are we then going to be making computer security better? Well, I would say pretty obviously no. We're just finding more and more ways for systems to be attacked. And of course, all of our conference, the conference will be fun, I guess. <laughs> so so I, I think we really need to work on this balance. Uh, so I have a modest proposal, uh, which is that we need a kind of Hippocratic oath for computer security. That is, you know, we need to make the patient better uh, in aggregate, uh, at least as a community, and uh, maybe even as researchers, uh, we need to think about how to balance our por portfolio of uh, research. Well, I would agree that ethics um, are very important, and there's something that many researchers um, have not thought about and more people are, are starting to think about. But security is not a scalar. It is not a magic pixie dust that floateth down from heaven and sort of sticks to your system. Security is about power. It's about relationships in business and government. And it's, it's how businesses can exploit consumers if they're monopolies. It's how governments can exploit their opponents. And everybody has got a different definition of security. My definition of security for Signal might be that the NSA can't read my traffic. Their definition of security is that they can. Right? These are completely incompatible. So you have to think about cui bono, who's benefiting from this. You have to think about more than just the, the, the sort of neutral Hippocratic oath of a doctor. You have to start thinking about consumer protection and competition policy and international relations and human rights and all sorts of stuff like that. That's, in fact, one of the things that makes this subject interesting. So, Ivo, before you ask your question, I would like to go to a slightly different topic that also concerns you. So stay there, please. Yeah. Um, so. We, I just put this slide because there is a discussion about, there is a conference that is organized by my respectful colleagues, uh, Nigel Smart, uh, Kenny Peterson, Dan Bonet, and others. Um, it's called Real World Crypto. Is the rest of the crypto unreal? Uh, we have a number of crypto papers here that may be very nice. Maybe in 10 years they get uh, some awards. But why do we need that? And let me just go through it some. And if we look at the fancy cryptography, this is not a criticism. It is just a provocative discussion. If we look at the cooking academy of uh, exotic crypto, we see, for example, secure multi-party competition. And in that sense, people have done, and I have done also research in that area as well, for practical secure multi-party computation or two-party computation. But also Nigel Smart is trying to, with his company to do a lot of work in this area, making things practical, and they are still working on it. But we have also a number of papers of almost, somewhat, maybe, or I don't know homomorphic encryption. The question is, when we do this research, and it research has the freedom to do anything that they want, and that's the good thing about it, um, why people start to write papers about it, about their midlife crisis, saying that these things have no practical impact. I cite from Philip Rugway's uh, ePrint paper, and that I'm also going to publish in IEEE Security and Privacy. So if our cryptographers are kind of in midlife crisis, what is actually, what is actually the, the problem here? Why we don't talk, for example, about conventional public key cryptography. We had a Turing Award winner here talking about and I was talking to Martin Hellman about conventional public key crypto has its own problems as well, like PKI, like, uh, let's say, global uh, uh, cross-certification. And we have lots of problems. So I would like to panel before Ivo asks the question. I would go to Bart. And what do you say about the fancy crypto versus conventional crypto? So, of course, Amat sent us all these questions in advance, except for those. I'm just clear. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, indeed, crypto has, has, um, is a discipline, I think, more than security has reached a level of foundations. It's more scientific in the sense that it's easier to prove things. But, of course, then at the same time, because of the foundations, it also tends to go off in directions which are less practical. Um, and I think it's also a sociological phenomenon that then in the crypto conferences, um, in the 80s and early 90s, there were still people designing RSA chips and people doing attacks on real systems together with theory. And somehow, after a while, the main conference became more theoretical. Um, new workshops have been created, like with Ross, we did uh, fast software encryption. Um, there was also chess, which is very applied. Um, I think now the ICR conferences accept more practical papers, but many of those actually moved to CCS. 
Um, so I re regret that in some sense because I think it's very important to have in one community both the theoreticians and the practitioners together. I think this is how both fields can develop very well. I think Real Crypto, Real World Crypto tried to answer this by having cryptographers talk again to, to practitioners in crypto more. And so people from industry give talks about what they've achieved. I think if you look at long-term problems, I don't think it's fair to make jokes. Well, you can make jokes always, that's fine. But I don't it think- It was not a joke, it was a provocative discussion. But I think we discussion. should also look at the challenging problems. I mean, public key crypto when it was invented could not be implemented. Right? Doing a 1024-bit RSA computation would have taken a lot of time on the mainframe in the late 70s. It was not usable. So I think it's fine to do theoretical work. Of course, there is sometimes a problem that for grant applications or for newspapers, it is being blown up as the next solution. Uh, I think this is very dangerous because what you see today is um, after Prism and all the other things we hear about the cloud, some business people say, oh, but there is fully homework encryption, so we can have all, our, all your data in the cloud. Well, of course, there is no fully homework encryption today. So I think we should be, it's not about the research itself, which I think is long-term and very valuable, and we should definitely not discourage. It's more about the framing of the research and what we promise from it. Uh, Ivo, so, uh, short, please, short. So related to impact uh, of our research on industry, The Guardian had an interesting article stating that the average budget for most companies that making new apps, and I presume the same is true for Internet of Things, is exactly zero dollar budget for security. Thank you. Was it a question or a comment? <laughs> or both? It was both, yeah? I think oh. both Anand and I can answer okay. that that's... Make it short, please. ...that that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, um, in fact, I would uh, say security has been a key pillar, not just from the point of view of, uh, you know, I guess our company's investment security, but also being able to direct security investments in academia through a variety of means to make sure that, you know, the research uh, that we were just discussing around, you know, fully maybe almost uh, homomorphic encryption, et cetera, continues to thrive and tries to push the boundaries while practical solutions get implemented today. But, but uh, yeah, I disagree with the statement. Yeah. Okay. If I, anything, the number is oh. going up. Oh, there is a question, a, of course. By a lot. Nigel, please. Of, because of the critical infrastructure nature of all of this stuff, right, the number is going up a lot, and you see that just by the industry sponsorship and industry participation. So, sorry, let's go to Nigel first, and then we change a bit. Okay, a okay so the first thing I'd like to do is uh, uh, thank you for the adverts. That was really good. Um, the check will be in the post. Um, and if anyone wants to come to Real World Crypto, it will be on the 4th to the 7th of January in New York, so please come along. It's not as big as CCS yet, but we have plans. Um, but what I would like to kind of say is that this, yeah, we do real-world crypto, but the people doing real-world crypto also do theoretical crypto, and I think one of the problems is with theoretical crypto is it gets overhyped. This issue of fully homomorphic encryption, you know, you would get phone calls from companies going, oh, we can encrypt the cloud now. And I think this is the problem that theoretical crypto has is it overhypes itself, and sometimes this, uh, you know, these small theoretical nuggets, they take many, many years to, to, to be deployed, and um, yeah. So my point. Okay, so thank you. So I would like to change uh, a slight, uh, slight twist for, for the topic. Uh, so when we talk about, I mean, that's for you, Greg. I first show some, some uh, slides and then uh, we ask the question. So US government organizations invest indeed a tremendous amount of money in, in cybersecurity research, also in US. It's very easy to scare people. Uh, they're very scary and uh, then they, um, then we have European Commission. Usually they take the DARPA proposal, copy and paste, and five years later they pro, uh, put it on the European Commission uh, project proposals. And of course there is UK, they do what they do. So we cannot really change it. Um, then we have Internet of Threads, and I'm just citing of uh, a possible uh, uh, United States pr uh, next president. And he was saying, uh, I don't do the email thing. So it has internet in it and it has thing in it. So it is the internet of things. Um, <laughs> so another aspect is that I cite again uh, Donald Trump, not because I'm against it, because if he, if he come to the other candidate, because these guys have a huge, tremendous uh, impact on also on the rest of the world, 
And if you read this, you don't need to read all of it. It says that we need control over internet, something that China and Russia has proposed long time ago. And this is a scary thing that I see coming because many research projects in other parts of the world are working on that. And I also see that. I cannot always talk about it. And as he says, we have, he says, yeah, people talk about freedom of speech, and uh, these people are foolish people. So this is one thing. Then I have another slide for you, and that's for Clinton's dilemma. So I assume that, indeed, there is a combination here of, of Google, Twitter, Facebook, and the rumors that these uh, guys can deliver lots of information to US government. And there is, of course, another dilemma that when you ask, uh, uh, when, when you ask <laughs> Bill Clinton, he, he may say something else about it. So actually, why governments, and these are the incidents from US, but we have a lot of problems with our governments in Germany, in UK. They, have, they are subject to lots of uh, different attacks. Why is that? We had this discussion before, but why is our government fail to apply those mechanisms they are funding with millions of dollars? Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so a couple of answers. One thing, it goes back to, you know, the U.S. government at least has similar challenges that Cisco has. There's, there's COBOL code still running on important systems uh, that for various budgetary reasons, you know, haven't been updated. And the administration is actually, you know, working to try and change that dynamic. That's a policy and political process. It's really not much of a technical challenge. The other challenge is that the U.S. government relies on commercial off-the-shelf systems. So it's what industry produces that the government must consume. It's not affordable for the government to go off and build its own systems. The Department of Defense decided back in the 90s that it couldn't afford to keep up. It used to be the major IT, you know, kind of investor for many years early in the uh, uh, the IT uh, uh, ecosystem, but in the 90s realized that it really had to rely on commercial ventures to provide it with the IT that, that it needed. And so it kind of comes back to this of, you know, as a research community, how are we helping enable sustainable security such that when someone's developing a new app, they don't have to think about some of these security challenges because it's already in the tool chain. It's already in, baked into the whole ecosystem that they're going to go into, and we're seeing that improve you know, in terms of some of the app environments uh, and the automatic updates, the continual updates, the ability of systems to have different versions of the software running within, you know, a cloud-based uh, 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 offering. So in terms of, you know, I think why the government's not, it's really, I don't think it's much different than what uh, broader society is, is challenged with. So the next question concerns actually, what are the strategic, so you are working on strategies, what are the strategic cybersecurity and privacy challenges that, or directions that you would like to support and these guys like write proposals for it? Yeah, so there was the question of challenge problems or you know, what are the, the, the long-term challenges? And you know, part of the work that I've been involved with is in, you know, some of you have seen this before, uh, the uh, Federal Cybersecurity Research and Development Strategic Plan. You can have it for 20 euro per yeah. Actually, there's, a, there's about eight copies down there on the table. Feel free to, to take one, but it's available online also. And, you know, it's not meant to be definitive, uh, but it puts forth, you know, three goals. Uh, one is, you know, having a more effective and efficient risk management. Another is sustainable security uh, development uh, for systems. And the third is defensive deterrence. Whether or not those are the right ones, you know, it's meant to put something out there and challenge the research community to say, you know, if you think there's better challenge problems, please tell us. Please, you know, have that come out of the, the community. Uh, there's also research objectives in there for you to consider. Uh, when I've talked about this in other places, I say here, you know, postdocs and graduate students, could you please write a thesis on some of these topics? So we're maturing as a community in having these conversations. If you look at the physics community and like nuclear, uh, the nuclear community, you know, they've been having these conversations for a very long time, and I think it's just a matter of us maturing, uh, you know, and being able to have these, these conversations where, you know, the community understands what the real challenges are that they're trying to, to focus on. And they can be, have direct practical applications, or they can be more esoteric. I mean, I think fully homomorphic encryption is actually an ex excellent example. 
I mean, if we can actually get something, some progress on that in the next couple of decades, that would be good news. Robert, yeah, I, very I, short. I, I think one thing that we could focus on here uh, that Ross mentioned earlier is usable security. You know, imagine uh, you guys here, if you, were, if you went out and asked how many people knew what a public key is. You know, I bet you you'd find very, very few people that could answer you. So uh, all the security stuff that we're building here, uh, to a large degree, it's not usable. And that's one of the problems we, we see when you know, these exploits come out. There's a very small community that knows it's much, it's growing quickly, which is scary, but there's a small community that understands what we've actually built. So, Bart, do you want to say something? So I we want go to say two to things. The last One about, topic. Of course, Europe is very good at, at criticizing itself, but in fact, we have the ERC program, which Ross already mentioned, where young researchers or also more senior researchers can get up to one and a half for the junior ones, two and a half million euro for the senior ones. That's even more in dollars. And you can actually do for five years what you want. You're completely free in choosing your topic. It's not tied by any industry constraint. It's just what you think is exciting research. And I think this is something Europe does very well, and there is no international counterpart, I think, to this kind of thing. On the research agenda, of course, I don't get to write those things, but after reading all the Snowden documents, I think we need an open and resilient infrastructure for our basic communications and systems. We can't have backdoors anymore. We can't have weird things happening in our devices. We should know what's happening in our devices. We need to have open software and open hardware. I think this community should work on this. So last th thing I would like to talk, I know that we, we are getting tight with the time, is this is the slide that I always use because I really like uh, the content of it. Um, in, U in, in Europe, we have a huge uh, program, EU program, for surveil surveillance. And the question is, you guys are doing research, you want the money, sometimes you don't care where the money comes from. And uh, I think this is an ethical question that I would like to uh, ask the panel, but also you as researcher. There is two scary things about it. The Snowden uh, revelation and uh, you were, you gave some talks about a post-Snowden era. Uh, what can we do actually against mass surveillance? So in this picture, you see that it is something that we didn't know, or at least pretended not to know. But there is something that is more scary. And I think that now it is so open that we also s tell people, not only we are uh, looking at you, but also we know all your relations, all your orientations, everything. Is that actually the right way that we are putting a lot of uh, uh, investment in privacy research. And on the other hand, many researchers, my colleagues, respected colleagues, some of them are doing surveillance uh, research. Is that ethical? Ross. Well, this is an interesting question because it's one of those on which America and Europe are starting to diverge fairly sharply. Um, a year and a half ago or so, you had the uh, PCAST report on cloud systems. Um, written by people like Craig Mundy and Eric Schmidt and so on, which the US government adopted, saying that privacy should only about, be about usage controls, not about data collection, not about aggregation in the cloud, but only what firm uses it for what purpose. Um, and a, day after, a, a couple of days after that, the European Court of Justice came down with the Menendez decision, Google versus Spain. And um, the view in Silicon Valley is that um, Europe is the world's privacy regulator now because Washington doesn't care and nobody else is big enough to matter. And I push it even further than that uh, by saying that Europe's about to become the world's safety regulator for similar reasons. All the stuff in Internet of Things, of monthly software updates of cars and so on, it's only going to be regulated here. Um, and so rather than railing directly against the NSA's abuses and activities, I think it's better to see the larger picture of privacy and safety in the whole, and what sort of regulatory interventions are needed um, against those excesses that naturally come um, with, with technologies which lead to large monopolies driven by network effects. Okay, so I'm sorry they are telling me they will kill me if I don't close. We can drink wine with the, all these VIPs, and uh, you can be our guest. I pay for you. So. Um, standard in any uh, panel discussion is that everybody says something visionary that sounds good, yeah? 
it's Ross. We had a discussion. What is the message? You have so much experience. What's the message for all these people, especially the youngster ones? It's the economics, stupid. It was? <laughs> it's about the economics. It's about, it's about the economics. It's about incentives. Um, people protect stuff if they really, really want to. And very often, people really, really don't want to. OK, very short. I think we have to build security for people and not for large corporations and for the state. And there should be open systems. Wow, that's a statement. <laughs> but, but Bart, there is this problem with funding. OK. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So I want to say something maybe against the panel to be controversial. I think we shouldn't be so picky about the practical impact of individual papers. I think here we talk a lot about the practical impact of individual papers, and that's not probably, my, in my opinion, the right granularity. We should look more at, you know, line of research after a certain amount of time. This is a dangerous statement because the evaluation section of your paper will be missing, and the PC member says, reject. Okay. Usable security. I think it was mentioned earlier. I think it's um, you know super critical. Something we don't focus as much as we should. I have a, a slide to that. Uh, I think if you guys could build an open and secure system, incremental, industry would just lap it up, right? I mean, we want to deliver a secure system. We want to deliver an open system, and we're working as hard as we can to do it. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. It's about sustainable security. Get your ideas into the tool chains. Show that you can uh, be part of the development process, whether it's part of the defense or part of the attack research that you're doing. Thank you. And my last word is fix Samsung Note 7. <laughs> so it could be a malware because they can't fix it. OK, thank you very much for your patience and for your participation. Thank you very much to the panel.